Hi there, my name is Ron Wright. I'm a professor of law here at Wake Forest University, the School of Law. We're going to be talking today about the regulation of wiretaps. These are situations where the police want to listen in on a telephone call or some other kind of electronic communication. There are special rules dealing with those wiretaps. Uh, and so we're going to talk about the history of that regulation and the way that it changed from judge-administered rules to rules created by the legislature, the special rules that apply to wiretaps. Let's go in and talk. Okay, folks, let's get started. We're going to talk about the different historical approaches to the regulation of wiretaps. Wiretaps are those times when the government agency, the law enforcement agency, wants to listen in on phone calls or, in other ways, monitor electronic communications. Uh, and our approach to this has changed a lot over the years, so we're going to take a quick tour of the, uh, of the history here. We start way back at a time when telephones were just becoming widespread. Uh, they were uh, pretty much in everybody's home, or not in everybody's home, but they were in a lot of homes by the 19-teens and 1920s. Also at that time, one of the big crimes being investigated at the federal level would have been various liquor offenses because we were in the middle of, uh, of prohibition. So the famous case here is Roy Olmsted versus uh, United States. Uh, Olmsted was uh, known as the king of the King County bootleggers, King County in the Seattle area in Washington. Really colorful, interesting guy, Olmsted, began as a police officer and he was arresting people who were running alcohol, who were in the alcohol business illegally. And then he learned the business while he was doing that and started running his own illegal alcohol business on the side. The police finally discovered him and kicked him off the force, arrested him. Uh, so he went into bootlegging full time, uh, developed quite a large uh, operation, became the, the king of the King County bootleggers uh, during, uh, during that period. Uh, he's arrested uh, and charged uh, in a major uh, federal case in 1925. Uh, he was one of about 90 defendants who were charged in one big case with him being the lead actor. Uh, and a big part of the evidence was obtained because the government tapped his phones. When we talk about wiretapping, think here of the physical wires. So remember at this point, we're not talking about cell phones, we're talking about phones that are all physically connected with wires. On the wall, wire running out of the wall, down through the wall, out into the you know, telephone poles and you know, strung between uh, locations. So it's a physical wire. And the government wants to come along at some point along that wire and physically tap into it. Get a needle and tap into the metal that's inside the insulation in the, uh, in the wire. So this is a tap of a wire, a physical tap, and it allows them to listen in on the electric signal uh, that is running along that wire. Uh, the uh, Olmsted challenges this and says, hey, wait a minute, you can't just listen in on my phone call any more than you could bust through my window and try to eavesdrop on my conversations from inside my house. So his challenge here is to the, uh, uh, is to the uh, to the technique that the government used to gather its uh, evidence. The trial court overrules this and says go ahead with it. Uh, there is a conviction of most of the defendants. Uh, there were guilty pleas for some of these 90 defendants. Some of them ran away to Canada. Some of them stayed and faced trial, but uh, some of them pled guilty. Of the people who, remaining, who were remaining who, who uh, were standing trial, about 25 or 30 of them, all but, I think, seven or eight were, were convicted, a few acquittals. Olmsted was one of the convictions. Uh, goes to jail for four years and pays a pretty substantial fine in the, uh, in the uh, currency of the day. Interestingly, he was pardoned a few years later by President uh, Roosevelt, part of the overall rethinking of whether prohibition was a, uh, was a good idea. But at any rate, his case after the conviction goes up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and he says, wait a minute, they can't physically tap the wire that comes out of my house uh, to listen in on my phone call. But the court agrees with the government here and says, no, the wiretap was okay, because they say, and I'll quote here, the language of the amendment cannot be extended and expanded to include telephone wires reaching to the whole world from the defendant's house or office. The intervening wires are not part of his house or office any more than the highways along which they are stretched. Uh, 
So it's a location-based test, right? It's were they in the house physically? If not, then they didn't trespass and there was no violation of a privacy right protected by the Fourth Amendment because the Fourth Amendment protects persons, houses, papers, and effects from unreasonable search and seizure. And the court says, this is none of the above. It's not a house, it's outside the house, and so forth. Uh, so that was the, uh, the holding of the court. Uh, the, uh, the dissent here, very interesting one from Justice uh, Louis Brandeis. Uh, some language that you, might, uh, that you might find familiar, and I won't read all of it here, but there's some interesting language here about the Constitution conferring against government the right to be left alone, a really interesting, or to be let alone, a uh, really interesting formulation of, uh, of uh, the privacy rights involved with these uh, regulations against unreasonable searches and seizures. And more general language here about the nature of tyranny, the nature of overreaching government. So Justice Brandeis says uh, in language that lots of people love to quote these days when the government's doing something that worries us, says, we should be most on our guard to protect liberty when the government's purposes are beneficent, when the government's trying to do something that they really believe is worthwhile. That, you know, we have the purest of motives, especially in that setting, says uh, Justice Brandeis, we should be most on our, go our, on our guard at that moment. Uh, so that's the dissent from Justice uh, Brandeis. Interesting sidebar in uh, Chief Justice Taft's opinion here. So Chief Justice Taft, uh, pictured here, uh, interesting, a former president, then later becomes Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the only time that's happened. Uh, but he has a little advice for Congress along the way here. So Taft says that, you know, it might be a good idea uh, if, uh, even though the Constitution doesn't regulate this, because that's what we're holding today, it might be a good idea if Congress were to regulate this. So Congress, maybe you should pass a statute that stops federal agents from doing this wiretapping business. So sure enough, a few years later in 1934, the Congress uh, gets together the votes to pass the 1934 Federal Communications Act, and it forbids federal agents from intercepting and divulging uh, material that they ob obtain through a, an electronic communication. Uh, notice it's intercepting and divulging, so it's not the wiretap itself that is illegal, it's the wiretap combined with giving it to uh, the courts, in, in, you know, divulging it to the world. Uh, later on, federal agents read this to allow them to tap wires and then to turn over what they learned to state authorities who might use it in state courts, but that remained a somewhat limited practice uh, in the intervening years. So, you know, a little over three decades pass, passes, no authorized use of federal, uh, of wiretap information in the federal courts. And then we get an interesting uh, new generation of regulation here. So we get New York that passes at the state level its own wiretap statute. And there's a challenge, and the Supreme Court hears the challenge in a case called Berger versus New York, 1967. And the court says, you know, nice try, close but no cigar. We think this still violates the Fourth Amendment. It's not as bad as, uh, as uh, you know, just an outright uh, allowing of it, but we think there's a, a problem with the, uh, with the New York uh, statute here because it doesn't really go far enough in our view now. Notice how far we've come from Olmstead when they said it's not covered at all. But now they're saying, yeah, under our new precedent, it's not just place-based. Under CATS, United States versus CATS, we've got now a, a reasonable expectation of privacy test that says the Fourth Amendment covers your privacy interests whenever there's a reasonable expectation of privacy. And it's not just physically, is it in the home? So under this new privacy-based or reasonable expectations-based test, the court says we got a violation. But, you know, you might be able to redraft this statute in a way that still satisfies the, uh, the new test. And they kind of offer a blueprint to New York and really any other legislature that wanted to try to authorize wiretaps. Uh, so the court says, you know, one thing that's wrong with this statute is that, um, is that it doesn't specify exactly what offense they think the, uh, the people on the line are going to be planning or uh, violating. And 
it doesn't really describe the conversations that you're expecting to hear when you tap these phones. And it offers a very long time period. Maybe if you shrunk it down to something less than two months, that might be reasonable under the Constitution. Uh, and, you know, your statute allows for uh, renewals that are just kind of automatic and, you know, go back to the judge and get further renewals time after time. And that's too open-ended. Maybe if you base all of your renewals on continued showings of probable cause, that might be good enough. Uh, and if you don't notify the target that you've, uh, you, are, uh, you are tapping the phone, well, maybe you need to be able to show exigent circumstances why, that would, uh, why you're not giving the notice. Uh, and ultimately, we think it might be closer to being constitutional, says the court, if you require some kind of return, just like we do with a paper warrant. If you require the officer to keep track of what they do and then go and explain to the judge after the fact, report to the judge how it all went and did you stay within boundaries. So in short, the court in Berger versus New York says this New York statute goes too far, unconstitutional, but if you offer us a more limited version of this wiretap statute, we might approve that as a, an appropriate and reasonable search and seizure under the, uh, under the doctrine that now covers this activity. The U.S. Congress was listening. They read the statute and uh, one year later they pass uh, a crime bill that includes Title III uh, that uh, authorizes and is still the basis for authorizing wiretaps by, uh, by federal agents. And under this uh, current blueprint, uh, we've got uh, something that a, a regulatory regime that's somehow different from regular old search warrants. So with regular old search warrants, the officer comes in uh, and, the, uh, and, the, and asks the judge for permission to carry out a particular search, uh, but it's the officer on the beat. What's interesting about the wiretap is a series of changes in how the authorization goes. So first of all, the request doesn't come from the officer on the beat. The request for a wiretap has to come from senior prosecution officials. You've got to work your way up the chain in the bureaucracy before you can uh, ask the judge for the wiretap. As for exigent circumstances under this statute, no, you don't really rely on exigent circumstances for your exceptions to the warrant requirement here. You just, uh, you just follow the statute rather than trying to make particularized exigent circumstance arguments in your particular case. Um, who decides on the scope of the wiretaps? Well, courts, but they have to do so here under fairly precise statutory limits. So the way this ends up working is that you have to give a lot more information on the front end in your wiretap application than you typically would in a usual uh, search warrant uh, affidavit and application. So the name of the officer applying, of course, but you have to specify an offense. I believe that, you know, the racketeering laws or the gambling laws or whatever, you have to specify which offense you're investigating. You have to name the nature of the facilities, like I'm tapping telephones or, you know, computers or whatever the uh, device is. I have to specify the nature of the facilities. Uh, I have to talk about the type of communication that will be accept inter intercepted. I have to specify a person who I believe might be committing the offense. Now, I might be able to listen in on other people's conversations as well, but I have to be fairly specific about who I think is talking and who I think is uh, violating the law. Another interesting requirement here is sometimes called the exhaustion requirement. That is, I have tried other methods and I have failed. I would love to find this evidence. I've tried other methods, but I can't get the information unless I wiretap because I've tried the other stuff and it's just not there. So that exhaustion requirement, I've exhausted other possibilities. There's also a minimization requirement that says, once I start listening, I have to only listen for a while. And if I realize, no, this isn't about the crime, then I, can put, I have to put the phone down. I have to minimize the amount of information that I take in. There's a little bit of gamesmanship that goes on here that you see depicted in television series where the mobsters who know they're being wiretapped, they just chat about the weather for a while or the, you know, the upcoming church service or something until they think it's been about a minute and then they get to their business. And so the agents learn about this and they 
get special permission to stay on the line a little bit longer to catch them in this manipulation. But it all stems from the requirement of minimization. That is, you have to only pick up co phone calls that are you know, producing some kind of evidence of, uh, of wrongdoing. So what happens, the series of events here is the, the police put together their very lengthy application. It can be dozens and dozens of pages long, much longer than the typical search warrant application and affidavit. Big application, they bring it to the judge. The judge reviews it, makes sure all the extra requirements are there above and beyond probable cause. The judge will sign off on the new, uh, on the wiretap application, but will say, okay, I'm going to require you to follow the, you know, these rules is in terms of minimization, or I'm going to limit your, uh, your wiretaps in the following ways, and you have to come back to me in 30 days and tell me how it's going and whether you're actually getting any information. And if you're not getting anything, you're going to have to give me a good reason to continue this. So you have to come back and re get reauthorization from time to time from the judge that is based on ongoing uh, probable cause. And then ultimately at the end of it, the, uh, the investigators have to come back to the judge and give a report about how it all, uh, how it all went. It's interesting, that's the federal wiretap statute. There are also state level wiretap statutes uh, that govern what state law enforcement officers can do and bring into state court. Uh, and they very often track Title III, the same kind of increased specific requirements to put into the application. Although it's also interesting, some states have a further strategy to say, you have to get this application. Also, you have to report to us, the state legislature, about how many of these applications you asked for in a given year. And, you know, you might notice, wow, how come you got triple the number of applications this year? So some kind of end-of-year accounting for the overall pattern of the use of wiretaps is part of, the, uh, part of the legal regime in the states. And we also get year-to-year -year reports from the Department of Justice about the number of wiretaps that they pursue and that are authorized in any given year. So you can see trends uh, across time. This wiretap business raises interesting questions about who regulates. What does the world look like when judges do the regulation by way of interpreting the statute, um, interpreting, excuse me, the, the Fourth Amendment's language about, uh, uh, about search warrants and probable cause and so forth? So how do you compare that regulatory regime, judges reading, reading constitutions, to this world of legislatures creating very specific statutes for how to go about doing the searches and then giving judges monitoring authority here, making the judge a little bit more involved in the day-to-day -day activity of the law enforcement officers, something that the judges are really normally not doing in our common law world. It's a very common feature of the civil law world, but here we're bringing judges into the day-to-day -day activities of law enforcement uh, agencies in a in a somewhat more regular way than, uh, than we do in other uh, settings. Um, what we tend to see is legislatures getting involved, particularly in areas that involve uh, technology, uh, that involve fast changing areas, uh, areas of intrusion on privacy uh, that involve intrusions into private property get the real attention of the legislature. So when we get together next time, we're going to be talking about this who regulates question. What does it look like when you move from judicial regimes of regulation over to more interaction between the legislature and the judiciary in terms of controlling the choices of police officers for wiretapping? So we'll talk about that next time. See you then.